Hello, welcome to the Whole Pet Academy show. And tonight we are continuing our um, Teton vendor interview series, but we are going to talk about self-defense. And tonight we have, see now that all of our names disappeared. Oh, <laughs> oh, that throws me off. <laughs> Hi, Robert. Well, it's <laughs> nice to meet you, Robert. Robert from DPP Defense, who will be at the Teton show but is um, has some really interesting information for us tonight. So welcome, Robert. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so where do we start here? Let's see. Um, how did you get into this business? You know, at a really young age, uh, I started collecting knives and decided yeah. if I was going to have knives, I better know how to use them. So from that point, it continued and snowballed on from knives to martial arts pressure points firearms and pretty much ran the gamut and then i always loved to uh, i've always loved hunting and fishing so it was second nature to study predators uh, both in the wild and uh, both animals and humankind okay all right um now before we get on the air we started talking about you were at the Teton show last year. So what do you want to tell us about that? How did that go for you? You know, I had a blast there. Uh, yeah. I was surprised just how uh, much what we teach is applicable to both groomers and boarders because where we address animals, the reading the body language for animals and humans, uh, it's a double whammy for you guys because you're often dealing with the owners and their pets. And we cover both of those aspects as far as identifying possible threats or possible dangers. And um, so how did you get into this? Like, how did you get into, you know, speaking and, you know, going to grooming conferences? Well, I've been teaching self-defense for about 30 years. Yeah. So I did stints in just firearms and different aspects um about two three years ago we had a, a friend of ours that stayed at our house because she was in a domestic violence situation so she came to us to find a safe haven and uh after we pretty much she's even though she's close to my age she's my, our adopted daughter uh she asked me on one of the visits after we got her stabilized and she had gotten a career in the military and started learning uh, medical training. And she asked me, she said, well, Robert, what, what would you really want to do with your life? And I hadn't really thought about it. I'd you know, been uh, in professions that uh, between store managers and operations managers and helping businesses with their inventory and all of that, and also establishing policies and procedures for safety and, and all the aspects that are needed, and realized that I really wanted to help people through either public speaking, which I really enjoy talking to people, especially in, on a, in the stage or public speaking venues, and decided I'm going to go full time and, and start teaching threat detection and mitigation. And the rest is history. So wow. I, I've been, when I was posting your your, your um, information that you had sent me and everything, can you elaborate on that a little bit more? It's very intriguing. Well, the reason why we don't just typically put self-defense, the DPP stands for Daily Practical Personal Defense. And- oh. The okay. way we look at it is anything that can or will hurt you or kill you is a threat to you. So we put it as teaching threat detection and mitigation because ultimately the best self-defense situation is the one you're never in. Mm -hmm. So we want to focus a lot on avoidance and we understand that you're going to be, you. it's possible to be hurt from anything from natural disasters to humans, to animals, and all of those different aspects. My wife, which is my partner in crime here, uh, 
she, her specialty is in natural disasters and emergency preparation. So we right. cover everything from emergency prep to helping your establish your mindset and strengthen your mind, which is just like any other muscle that as you build it and strengthen it, you can be more resilient and be able to overcome challenges that hit you. Mm -hmm. and that threat detection, I realized that very early on in the industry that most people don't address the different types of predators that are out there. And I realized that there are those mindsets parallel both animals and humans. And there are three main types of predators. And if you can I, learn to identify each type, that you deal with each type differently. So manipulating those different types of predators, when you can identify what they are, you can manipulate them to increase your odds of not having a violent outcome, but that they will recognize you as not prey and not worth of being a victim. And so they will focus on other things and because they don't real they they don't want to get hurt. They don't want to get killed and they don't want to get caged. Hmm. How did you come up with three? Like, what are the three? And I know that get, probably goes on for a lot of information there, but what are the three? You know, the the reason why most people, I, I realize people, most people don't know the those. Yeah. I, just, I wrote a book on it and it's oh, in, excellent. getting ready for publishing. But there's, the first one is the scavenger lever, level or lower, lower, the, if I can spit it out, scavenger level or lower level predator. Now, we use the term predator very wide. So it is anything that can hurt or kill you. So it covers everything from humans, animals, predators, and non-predators alike, which most of the time when you think of predators, you think of lions, tigers, and bears. Mm -hmm. This covers cows, deer, yeah. uh, moose, all of that body language fits in, in those three criteria. So you've got your scavenger level. The next one is your alpha apex level or high level predator, which most of your serial killers and, and human traffickers are because they're more skilled and more comfortable in their craft of murder and mayhem. And then you've got the most dangerous, which is the sick or disassociated predator. And the sick or disassociated predator you can swap between those three by different environmental introductions. So you can take a thug that's just barely learning how to be a thug, and he's going to be a lot more jumpy. He's going to be a lot more nervous. Once he gets more comfortable, then he can move in. Or if he has friends, which he packs up, then he becomes stronger and more confident, which will turn him into an alpha apex level predator. And if you introduce narcotics, mental illness, any of those factors, or even sickness, then you can push the, either one of those predators into the sick or disassociated. Of course, the best example of a sick or disassociated is, which we've all seen, is mama bear. So yeah. you never want to get in between a mom protecting her kids. And that's a sick or disassociated predator. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, I would, uh, one that comes to mind too, is someone who's drunk, drunk and belligerent, yeah, <laughs> which you might think you don't grooming. run into in dog grooming, but I've run into that at somebody's house, <laughs> being a house call groomer. Yeah. Oh, and there are cases with animals that when you're going in to groom and the animal hasn't been groomed for a long period of time and the owner doesn't realize that that animal is sick, which some of those symbols are, or some of those signs are emaciated bodies, uh, disheveled hair, missing patches of hair, which is the same for humans and animals. A lot of it is, if you see that goop in the eyes, that animal isn't healthy and it increases your odds of that animal either striking out because of fear or striking out because it's sick and, and hungry and it doesn't really care about its well-being. It's going to defend itself. Yeah, we, we do see a lot of animals in a wide variety of health states. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Especially as they get older. 
where, you know, it's not even like an illness. It's just that their body's degrading and dementia and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have this broken down for us to recognize threats of all sorts. That's pretty neat. That's pretty neat. Um, and, oh, go ahead, Chrissy. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, well, I was just going to go in. So um, when did, uh, I, I'm just curious how did, you approach Gabby last year to vend or, or come and speak, or how did that dynamic happen? Well, we, uh, we try to do as many shows as possible Okay. and we sell our apparel and we sell, you know, knives and a few other things to, to help pay for the booths. But we try to get our name and, and our message in front of as many people as possible. So we do a lot of craft shows. We do a lot of gun shows because, craft shows our main demographic are females and as so is the grooming industry we, we try to get in front of them and so when yeah. we found out about this expo we said hey give us a chance to do a booth we're in front of people it'd be great because we do deal with both animals and humans mm -hmm. and when she she says sure go ahead and then when she was looking through our application she says well what exactly do you because we put on there that we promote our business. Yeah. So what exactly is your business? What? And I told her and she said, well, that would be awesome. Will you speak? And I said, sure, I'd love to. Oh, so, that's great. Yeah. So no. Uh, what state are you located in? Where are you located? We're actually just north of where the expo is. So we're in Rexburg, oh. Idaho. We're okay. in the frozen north. Not too far. Frozen north. That's his backdrop behind him, which is yeah. lovely. It's pretty. <laughs> so this is local for you then. That's excellent. Yeah, it makes it really nice to be able to have a local show. Uh, we were pushed really hard to uh, apply to speak at the big show in Vegas as well. And I was surprised how many people came up to me after and said, come teach at my facility or uh, you really should go and speak at this larger, this other expo too, and in Vegas. And so we have worked through and we're going to apply for, we've already applied for speaking there as well. But I would, I enjoy to speak close to home as often as possible because we travel quite a bit. I bet. Yeah. I bet. yeah. So um, one of our questions here that I think is really interesting is what's your competitive advantage over colleagues? Like there are a lot of self-defense and, you know, what, what makes you different? Well, as we said, as I said before, um, mm -hmm. one thing that makes us unique above anybody else is we address the body language of both animals and humans. Uh, okay. When our foundation is understanding that your brain and every uh, biological animal uh, and we fall under that criteria, their brains are hardwired for self-preservation. And when you can understand that in humans, it's a little bit more disconnected that our subconscious doesn't necessarily speak to our conscious mind in a lot of different factors. We teach how to train your subconscious mind to communicate with your conscious mind. Here's a perfect example. Uh, think back when you bought a car. Did you notice that shortly after you bought that car, that everybody around you was driving that same model and color as the car that you just bought? That mm. just every time you turn around, there was there was more of them. It's not that you were so mm. cool that everybody went out and instantly bought the same vehicle as you bought. Your subconscious, through the steps of of that effort of purchasing that vehicle because it's not a quick painless uh, process, your subconscious went, oh, my, your conscious mind wants to know that. It wants to identify it. Well, in that same aspect, we can teach you how to run through those different exercises to train your subconscious to identify those tells, which we call them tells are our indicators of a possible threat or how to identify that there might be a danger that's there, which 
it manifests in several different ways that we've all felt. How many times have you had the hair on the back of your neck stand up or mm -hmm. goosebumps on your arms or, or mm -hmm. goosebumps on, on your body or mm -hmm. butterflies in your stomach that, you know, that gut reflex that, oh, well, I knew something was off. Mm -hmm. There's my gut told me there was something wrong. Well, we teach you how to tap into that. In fact, often I tell people, if you have that feeling in your gut and you're learning, you know, you've learned how your, your gut responds, take a deep breath and start paying attention to your surroundings because your subconscious is telling you there's something up. And the reason why I tell you to take a deep breath is because you need oxygen to be able to react and then ultimately turn that table so that you can act upon those uh, possible threats, which action is always faster than reaction. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, how, just, I mean, it's just, how, where did you get all your training? How did you get to possess this? Well, I train regularly with, with a gentleman that was one of the original instructors of the Marine Hunter program, which is when the military started utilizing situational awareness when we first went into Iraq and uh, Kuwait and we started getting uh, our soldiers killed because they weren't fighting a body of soldiers that were in uniforms like the traditional combat that we've known for for decades. Okay, yeah. And so they were trying to figure out how to utilize and up until that point, in the self-defense industry, situational awareness was just voodoo or hokum. And then when they started seeing it truly be useful in combat situations, that's when it started getting more accepted. The same aspect of where I've been able to study predators and realized on my own that studying the body language of, because I, I've trained my own dogs, I've dealt with my own, I've dealt with uh, animals for almost all my life. And when I've hunted and dealing with hunting animals, there's a difference in the mindset of those that are predators and those that are prey. When you're dealing with uh, deer or elk, in fact, we had a, a meeting with the Fish and Game years ago that they were talking to us about bear population and, and mountain lion population. And they were saying that the bear population in Southeast Idaho was just, you know, onesie twosies and that's it. And several of us that knew better spoke up and said, no, you're, how are you trying to find these predators? And they said, well, basically the same way as we're trying to find deer and elk, we fly over and we count them. And it, you can't do that because predators naturally have camouflage and they manipulate their surroundings so they blend in. If you've ever noticed and dealt with game or, or wild animals, there are deer and elk that will walk along the game trails. Predators will be around the game trails, but they zigzag. They don't spend all their time on those game trails because they're where their prey is, but they're off to the peripheral so that they can attack that prey. And as I was studying those predators, that's when I discovered that there were the three different types. And as I trained with multiple law enforcement agencies and, and, and different groups, I realized that they weren't tapping into that. They were trying to focus on overpowering and controlling or destroying that predator and not trying to manipulate it and avoid a conflict, which most of my clients are those that and I'm not going to have a 13-year-old girl try to do an arm bar and manipulate and control a 250-pound guy all, that's all solid muscle. It's just not feasible. So you've got to work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah, prevention is key. Um, something that you said there, too, because I'm the behavior geek here. But um, I, I tell people, I'm like, when you start knowing what to look for with the animals, like there's a point in my career where I would have said I had a feeling that dog was going to do that. And then you start noticing what all of those things were that you were subconsciously noticing, 
but your brain didn't rationally understand that I saw him stiffen, I saw a sharp eye, and then because I didn't stop, he turned and did a fast snap. That some of these things are very predictable if you know what you're looking for. And part of that that we teach on not only identifying that is articulating it afterwards so you can process it. And unfortunately, when you're dealing with human beings, after you defend yourself, you're going to have to defend yourself often in the courts. And if you can't articulate to law enforcement and to the legal system exactly why you responded the way you did and that you knew that you had to use force because you had seen that action coming in before it happened, when you can explain why, it not only helps you be safer with law enforcement and explaining to others and helping increase the safety of your family and your coworkers and your employees, but it also helps you be able to identify it and pinpoint what exactly those behaviors are leading to and how to react to them so that you can manipulate it so that it doesn't turn into and I've seen this a lot with dog trainers that when they, the really good dog trainers understand how to read the bodies and the body language of their dogs when they are apprehensive or when they're fearful, because some of those are very subtle. And unfortunately, the general population don't know, they, they liken human act activities to dog activities, which when you're dealing with a possessive or territorial behavior or you know humans they smile to try to show that they're friendly but the base root of that is is defenses you're defending yourself you're showing your teeth you're putting the others in check and dogs are the same way uh-huh. so are cats so are mm-hmm. yep yep the advantage um, of dogs and cats is their tails tell us a lot and their fur is exposed so you yeah. can read the the raising of the hair, you can read whether they're missing patches or whether their hair doesn't look healthy. You can read and be able to tell what type of mindset that they may be in. Yeah, and diffusing things is more important. Diffusing those situations is more important than how you're gonna get in there and win. Um, Anytime someone's like, oh, how do you get in there and win? I'm like, oh, mm," you know. Um, So I wanted to ask- You've already lost. You've already, you, mm. you've already in the losing aspect. Now we do cover targets and strikes, and they're universal and effective in everything from animals to grizzly bears to humans. I mean, the the mm. targets that we teach are very effective, but can maim and kill. Which, when you're needing to stop a threat, in fact, we use one term that I can help you with your mental picture of just how you need to fight when violence is required, when you're to that point where you can't escape or can't manipulate it out of it, is sometimes you have to fight like a rabid stray cat that just got cornered by a two-year-old toddler. And that's the best way that I could think Mm -hmm. of to describe that mindset Mm -hmm. that you would need to be at when or if you have to actually use violence to defend yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody wants to be put in that situation. No. (laughs) And and go ahead. I know you had a question. So I do house call grooming. So I'm actually traveling into people's homes and there are a bunch of things that I tell other house call groomers. So um, I'll run it by you. See what you think. (laughs) But one of those things is um, I don't go to anybody's house without doing some sort of a phone interview. We have to actually chat and not just what time, what's your dog's name, but but actually chat. I need to know that um, this person sounds pretty reasonable. (laughs) That's that's a voice chat. You're saying a voice chat, not a text message chat. Yep. Yep. No, this is phone call. Old school. I want to hear in your voice. I want to want to hear your responses to your dog might not be finished today, you know, like that based on behavior issues and stuff. I want to hear if you're going to argue with me about that. Um, You know, so that's the first thing is that I'm like, you know what, 
just get a chance to talk to that person. If something feels off, trust that. Sometimes something Pay feels off. Pay attention to the answers that they give you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Because that will um, give you keys. <laughs> Yep. Yep. I do go on Google maps and kind of take a look at the neighborhood. Um, not that that's a huge thing, but there have been a couple of situations where it's like, yeah, all right. What time of day am I going over there? You know, but, um, cause there are, there are times where it's like, oh, that's a dicey neighborhood. And I've lived in some dicey neighborhoods. Let me tell you. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> I think that's part of the way you get some street smarts like, hmm. <laughs> but, um, and then I also, um, I encourage other house call groomers to not only have somebody know where you are, but to make that super obvious when you get to someone's house, like, oh, let me just text. Cause I need, he just needs to know where I am. Cause I always tell somebody where I am while I'm at somebody's house. Um, just as this added protection that they're thinking like, oh, okay. So somebody knows where she is and that this appointment should only take this amount of time. Um, and then I also tell house call groomers to keep your phone and your keys on your body. And at any time you feel threatened or feel worried or feel like something's gone wrong, just take that dog out of the tub or off of the table and walk out the door without your stuff. Just grab your phone and your keys that are in your pocket and just walk out, <laughs> get out of there, call the police and say, please come and help me grab my stuff. Um, I, I really didn't feel safe. What do you think of those? <laughs> those are really good suggestions. One thing that I would suggest that you can also add to the basically casing the area or, mm -hmm. or understanding the, the area. Most places in the U.S. have apps through the sheriff's reporting as far as crimes in certain areas. So oh, you can good. read the recent crimes and see what types of crimes they are and what location they are in relative to your appointment. So you can be able to read and see what's going on. And because not necessarily your clients are not the only source of a threat. You've got mm -hmm. other sources as well that you've got to consider in your biggest and most vulnerable place is any place of transit. So if you are in transition, mm -hmm. Any uh, executive protection agency will tell you that is the most open point that you can be is when you're moving from point A to point B. And when you're getting to the site of, of your appointment, you are vulnerable. Now, the, the last aspect that you were talking about with making sure that you keep your keys and your phone on, on you, also watch for predatory behavior, hunting behavior. Uh, certain things, what I mean by that is um, space is your friend. They're not going to be getting up and close into your face and they're not going to be moving and maneuvering behind you because your scavenger level predator will always, well, when you think of, of the ankle biters, the little dogs, that they're not going to come at you right at your, your face or right, right head on. They're gonna to try to hit you from the side or the back. And as long as you're watching them and they know that you see them, then they're gonna hold off because they know they don't have advantage and they don't wanna get hurt. So when you're in those aspects, you need to pay attention to where other people are if they're moving in behind you. We train a lot of, uh, of agents for, uh, uh, real estate and mm. they're going into the same type of situation. Mm. And if you're walking in, never lead into a room, never. And always make sure that you have, and you are aware of all of your exits. So always make sure that you have an exit of that room. Mm. So if somebody comes in and they're standing in the doorway, it's okay to speak up. Communication is one of your biggest tools that you can use to be able to not only stop a possible attack, but also to uh, be able to avoid anything from abuse to any kind of other manipulation. When you speak up and use your voice, you're gonna have a lot more power and you're gonna be um, able to be crystal clear as far as if they have in 
wrong intentions that you know what you're doing and they're you're not worth trying to attack. <laughs> So also, I, I didn't even think about that because if you're walking into somebody's house and they're usually they're like, oh, right, this, you know, right. You you step in and mostly for first time visits, I would think, because after repeat visits, you kind of got your your groove on and, and no, have a different relationship with them at that point. But typically, I don't know, Chrissy, when you go to somebody's house for the first time, have you thought about that way when? How oh, do I do. Them? I think I think about that stuff. Yeah. Um, but I'll tell you, don't let your guard down just because it's someone you know, because the couple of times that I have run into a situation, it was when they had a family member over. So well, it, one it's not was just a that boyfriend person. that turned out later was pretty abusive. And I got that vibe off him. I'm like, I'm working over here and you need to go in the other room or I'm going home. Do you want the dog groomed or not? And I told him he had to go in the other room. Um, and another time when it was someone's adult son came over drunk while I was grooming. And so you even can have with somebody who is know. respectable in the community that everybody goes, oh, He's a he's a deacon in his church, and he's an, yeah. uh, a chairman of multiple of their of their uh, committees. And do you realize that BTK Killer was a deacon in his church? He was extremely active in his church, and he was yeah. a chairman of multiple committees of his church. He was a respected businessman, but yet he murdered and tortured multiple people, and you can also have somebody that you've had constant, I mean, that they're your regulars and you've been there 30 times and due to other uh, environmental uh, changes, mm -hmm. uh, change in relationship, change mm -hmm. in stress, there are so many different factors that you can't negate your gut feeling and you can't just say, okay, yeah. any person has a free pass of, that they're safe because they aren't. Yeah. I mean, even my, if my wife, after I've, I mean, I've been married to her for 21 years and I love her dearly, but if she were to pull a knife and start showing those behaviors, I'm going to, I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to make sure I'm, I'm uh, safe and I'm away from it. I'm not going to go, Oh, well, she's not going to hurt me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And there have been some, there's some, there have been some, uh, there have been some dicey stories from house call groomers about people who were drinking. Now this person's acting very different than they normally do, you know, and um, yeah, there, there's some really dicey stories. Mobile groomers have very similar issues because they are coming into the house often to like take hold of the dog, bring the dog out to the, out to their unit, you know, um, but yeah, I think, um, one of the ones I remember is a friend of mine worked at an animal hospital that was also the local pound and they reached a point where they put up bulletproof glass around their, their desk because they had been threatened a couple of times. People didn't want to pay the fee to get their dog out of the pound. Like they were constantly having aggressive people come in. I was like, why well, do you work there? <laughs> the environment that we live in today um, between media, between politics, between all these other uh, social aspects, we are becoming more and more uh, agitated, more and more violent, more and more stressed. And so you've got an increased chance of narcotics. You've got an increased chance of trafficking. You've got, there's so many different aspects that, it, that you've got to be even watching closer more now and you know up until a few years ago people here in rexburg idaho would go oh we never would have any worries as far as we're safe we can leave our doors unlocked well when i was a kid we had a serial killer that killed multiple women uh, recently in the last few years we had a school shooting in rigby and we had uh I spent over a week looking for evidence because I volunteer with search and rescue and looking for evidence on a home invasion homicide that happened right in Rexburg. So we have it even in this little area and 
one of the biggest things that we fight in our classes is denial because denial will hurt you faster than any attacker. Yeah, yeah, to think that like, no, it wouldn't happen here. Yeah, it can happen anywhere. And, and it will. <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. There, I know there are so many things to think about. I know, <laughs> I know. Now, like, oh, man. So when, um, what, I guess, coming into the show and everything and knowing that we are a female-dominated industry, um, as mobile house call, we've got groomer, like at our school, um, in Portsmouth, you know, we, as this being state regulated, one of the things we have to be prepared for and have an emergency plate, an emergency evacuation plan for is hostile threats and how to, deal with with that or or what they not hostile threats but they call it terrorists mm. for shootings and how we would handle that as a school um so how i mean besides is there other people in other states that do similar to what you do that i could help my team get training on this and uh be a little more I, I know we have uh, a class on it um but having that hardcore like you're talking about I mean especially I, I, I think back and go where they're late um the girls are leaving it gets dark about 4 4 30 all winter long um they're leaving at six, seven o'clock and can't see into the woods behind us. So now you got me. <laughs> now my goal, my goal is Whereas to I'm always paranoid. So I was like, wait, no, I'll walk you out to your car. Let's double check everything. Lights I, are on, got the phone on. Like, I'm Yeah, just, and I did tell, and I do like them parking close to the door and ask them, you know, before it gets dark, move closer to the front door make sure you're going out together. But, but again, I mean, that's only as good as they're thinking about it. And Chrissy's not always there to say, I'll walk out with you. You know, they're just some girls just ready to get out the door and go. And their minds are 20 steps ahead of them. They're not in that moment of walking out that door. Even if they're together, they're not in that moment. So, so we teach those tools so that, we can empower our clients. Mm -hmm. we, we don't want you to, you know, you, there are so many different threats that you can think of that you can be cowering in the bathroom of your house and never want to step out the corner of a panic room in your house. But when you have those tools and when you learn how to carry yourself, you become more confident and mm -hmm. confidence is a great uh, warding off of predators. When you're confident, and there are several things that we teach. Now, as far as somebody else or other groups that teach what we teach, there are others that teach aspects of what we teach, but not quite covering uh, the spectrum that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, we're unique in the fact that we uh, identify and recognize the three different types of predators, which, to my knowledge, there are nobody else out there truly uh, explain it or understand it the way that's why I, I wrote my book is because it's not really out there and it needed to get out there yeah uh, we're we are happy to travel so we do like to teach and and I'm happy to do uh, virtual events as well like this one uh, mm -hmm. especially after COVID and everything I had to get more proficient on and on being able to do a lot of this and most yep. of the what we teach doesn't have to be hands-on. We can give you exercises and we can give you homework basically to work on that you can master and be able to be a lot more comfortable and a lot more safe. One aspect when you're talking about your car, uh, there's a few things that we always suggest that first off, lock your doors. The best lock out there is useless unless you use it every time you pass through the door. It's 
I mean, so many people with their homes, they can have this awesome deadbolt and reinforced door. But if you don't turn the stupid little knob, it's useless. It's, yeah. it's, a, mute, it's a moot point. Now, another factor is get off the X. When you go to your car, pay attention to where you're traveling. If you had to make a phone call, don't make a phone call while you're walking to your car. Make a phone call inside the building and then walk out to your car. If you're going to carry tools to defend yourself, which the reason why I call them tools and not weapons, is God gave you the ultimate weapon to use anything as a tool. So when you're familiar and comfortable with packing a tool, whether it's anything from a firearm, an edged weapon, impact weapon, or even uh, all these nifty little key attachments that you can put on your keychain, be familiar with that tool, what it can and can't do. And then when you do get to your car, get in your car, start it up, and go. Because if you're going to be ambushed there at your vehicle, that predator knows your vehicle and knows when you're knows where you're going to be. He just doesn't know when you're going to be there. So if you get in there, there's a reason why he's chosen you to ambush you there. So if if you get in your vehicle without a, a sign of anybody around you, get in your vehicle, start it up and drive. Don't mess with your keys. Don't mess with your purse. Get in there and get off the X. Even if you have to drive 100 yards down the road and then stop and mess with your keys, you have changed the scenario of where that predator can attack you because you're changing it to where you're under control, in control, not them. Yeah. So that's one of the quick aspects that you can do. But there are so many different things that we can that we teach and that can help uh, cover the whole gambit. Yeah. And um, as a house call groomer, I got to say, like, I, I have loads of equipment to unload and pack up again. And, you know, there's a lot of, you know, at the back of the hatchback and loading things in and pushing them in and making sure everything fits again. And um, there are times where you just drop your guard. And when you're dealing with kids or you're dealing with gear, what I would recommend with that is work up a setup that you can contain when you're done with grooming so all you have to do is take that and put it in with our jump kits which is a, a massive uh, first aid kit that we keep in our vehicles all of that is compartmentalized so that when we use it we know where it's at we know how to access it when we put it away and and zip up that bag when we go to the vehicle all we have to do is put it in the vehicle and we're done my rescue packs the same way I have that work done when I'm in a in a safer place or in a place I've established the surroundings. So when I'm transitioning, I'm not messing with that. It's the same way with with kids that are uh, in car seats. First of all, you scan and make sure that there's nothing around you, and then don't spend a lot of time. Do it in spurts, so it it doesn't hurt to when you take a breath. Pop your head around, look around. Ted Bundy said that he could read uh, a victim by the tilt of her head and by the way she walked. And ultimately, that body language of every a lot of our clients. In fact, I talked with a client uh, a couple months ago that she was assaulted in daylight, broad daylight. She was walking to her car, and a guy walked in and walked up behind her and groped her. And before she could do anything, he had backed off and gotten away. What she was doing is she was, as we were talking about, well, just what we talked about, she was messing with her purse. She was trying to get in her purse and grab her keys and figure out things. Having the keys in your hand when you walk through not only helps you as far as not have to fish around with them, but depending on what you have on that keychain, you can use as a tool. One popular myth is put the keys between your fingers. Now, if you've ever hit something with a key, especially a small metal key in between your fingers, it it's gonna hurt. doesn't feel good. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not effective. Yeah. Now, depending on some of the bigger keys, if you can hold it, manipulate it, yeah, but you wanna practice with that before you assume that 
that's the way because I heard it on social media that I could do that. Hmm. How about backing into a spot versus being pulled in? Backing in has so many benefits. Number one, you are more likely to run into a vehicle when you're leaving a parking spot than when you're entering one. So when you're entering it in, you can see what's there and it's easier to back in. Also, if you need to get away quickly, drive out forward and be able to deal with uh, obstacles, possible threats, than it is to try to back up and then shift gear into first gear and then and go. So ultimately, backing in is always your best bet, not only for the safety of others, but for your own personal safety as well. Do you back into cars, into parking space at home when you go to home, Chrissy, to homes? Do you um, in driveways or get where you can get to the car fast? Like, I kind of like, don't because I worry about dogs being loose <laughs> and I don't have a backup camera. So I'm always kind of like watching for their dogs. But then I, I'm, I'm watching everything. So, yeah, but I am aware that I'm definitely, you know, have to be on guard, but then I was kind of raised that way and I've lived in some really dicey neighborhoods. <laughs> you can always you know? pull through. I mean, there, yeah. there, if you have a choice yeah. between a parallel parking spot or a place to pull through, you can always do that. Yeah. And then well, you your driveways. Driving. You know, like backing into someone's driveway, like I'm, I worry about their dog coming out to say hi <laughs> while I'm backing in. But yeah, I mean, there are a lot of things to think about. And um, I think it's really important too that we mentioned that it's not just for women. Yes, I, I know. Yeah, Thanks. yeah. Um, I, I know one of my uncles told me a story about walking out to find somebody trying to break into his car. You know, like, I mean, guys, guys get victimized too. And, and, you know, in different ways, very different ways. Well, when you're dealing with the alpha apex level predator, there mm -hmm. are men that are strong men that are trafficked just as much as women are too. I mean, there's yeah. more trafficking, human trafficking than just the sex trafficking, but yeah. men are trafficked in the sex trafficking trade as well. Yeah. And typically yeah. they're started in the youth. So when you're younger, there, there are just as many boys that are assaulted when they're they're young, and the stigma is you're not a man's man if you've been uh, assaulted or if you've gotten somebody's gotten the better of you. So they're not going to speak up as much as as women. Even but even with women that are assault victims, the reporting numbers are just dismal compared to the actual cases of of attack. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't report things. Yeah. Because they see it as like, well, why? I mean, you know, <laughs> because that person could be doing this every week to somebody else. You don't know that you got to report it. We start every class with three bullet points. And the first one is you are worth fighting for. You are worth defending. And even training first responders that are some of the burliest, most you know, most non-hesitant type people I've ever met between training uh, like the, the law enforcement chaplaincy to uh, search and rescue and other groups that we've trained, uh, they have a tendency to view themselves as less important. And that's how predators feed on, especially manipulation, that they go, okay, that person is doubting themselves and so I can attack them because they're not going to report it. They're not going to fight back because they view themselves as not worth it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the main points that I try to drill into people's minds on every single class that I teach. That makes a lot of sense. Yep. I know so many things to think about. I know. And I'm looking at your logo. Is it supposed to be a knife? A knife or a sword. Okay. <laughs> like I, it's, it's, now we're talking like, what? Uh, can't, not a fish. I know they're out in the Not a fish. <laughs> I, I, told my, I told my designer, I told him exactly what I wanted. And mm -hmm. he tweaked it a little bit and he got exactly what I wanted. I had yeah. it in my mind. 
and I've always loved edge weapons. Like I said earlier, yeah. that's what got me started is starting to collect those things. I mean, I was in kindergarten and the teachers would borrow my knife that I would pack with me. And they're like, well, you really shouldn't have a knife here. And then inevitably they're like, hey, Robert, can you uh, let me borrow your knife? I need to use it. So I, I always pack a knife. And if I don't have a knife, then even when I'm flying, I have a tactical pen and I try to pack a flashlight with me all the time too, because those are valuable tools that you can use in everyday life and defending yourself. Mm. Yep. Those big, those big mag lights are a club. <laughs> well, see, my, my tactical flashlight is yeah. a relatively small one, but it's a perfect impact weapon. Mm. So and I can see things it's dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. So should we end this with a with something fun? <laughs> with something fun. Dara's over here like rethinking her whole life. <laughs> she has her back to the door and now she's suddenly aware. <laughs> I know. I'm like, I got my back to the door. <laughs> the stare like, what's behind you? <laughs> I know. Well, I will tell you, I am we and Lee knows every time when we go out, I do not like my back being to the windows or the door. I want to see the whole room. And my family always jokes, they're like, oh, it's because because we're Italian. They're like, it's it's that's your Italian gene, Dara. That that's all it is. <laughs> yeah, my wife knows me so well that she she knows which spot I'm gonna sit. But she knows where I'm yeah. gonna sit. Yeah, yeah. Hands well, down let's see, it's like, you going there? Okay. <laughs> I, I change it up by who I'm with, you know, really? like if, if that's somebody who I think is equally um, aware of everything going on, you know, but like, I don't like, so thinking about trade show stuff, you know, I mean, yeah. like, don't, don't leave your bags open. Don't put your bags on the floor. Keep them on your body, you know, <laughs> hold on to those things, put things back in your room. If you have a whole bunch of stuff. Um, what other things would you tell people about going to a trade show? Don't put your drinks down. Mm. Whether Sit at the booth, not at the bar. Any type of booth, any type of you know your coffees, anything. Just you just never know. Yeah. Yeah. Sit food or drink, together. anything that you're going to consume, and trust your gut. All you have to do is really trust your gut. If you if you trust that feeling, and the vast majority of victims of violent crimes said and have have said that. I knew something was off, but I dismissed it. You're you're smarter than you think, and it's okay to walk out of a space just because it didn't feel right. Because it's better, the best self-defense situation is the one you're never in. Absolutely, absolutely. It's about staying safe. Staying safe. Yeah. All right, Robert, here's your last question. <laughs> What's your spirit animal? <laughs> My spirit animal yep. is a wily coyote. <laughs> <laughs> I still have to end on a laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, well, I'm really looking forward to meeting you at Teton. We're going to have a really good time. And no, I've got it. your That's website awesome. posted. What is the best way for people to reach you? The best way to reach me is to go to DPP Defense, mm -hmm. and that's with an S. So it's D E F E N S E dot com. And that's our website. And there's links there for all of our social media sites, which I'm on. I try to be on all of them. So I've got everything from Facebook to Instagram to Twitter to uh, next door even. So, yeah. and it's, it's, in, the, it's nice in the website. comments as far as the, the website too. Fabulous. Yep. It's a very nice website. And if somebody wanted uh, out of state to get your, or acquire your online services for teaching a class for their employees, is that, I know you talked about doing that. So do you have- We've had people approach us. We travel, um, mm -hmm. trailer that 
that keeps Bob, our body opponent bag, and Wiley Coyote, our 3D dog, and <laughs> all of our, our gear in. Uh, so we travel quite a bit. Uh, we're happy to travel around and teach classes. In fact, on March 10th, I'm going to be teaching in Boise. Uh, we've got people that have approached us as soon as their facilities are up and running down in Arizona to come down and teach. Uh, I've got a close quarter combat instructor that is having me going to be down in uh, in Phoenix area coming up in, in another year or so. So we travel around. We're happy to do these kind of situations where we can do it over Zoom if you want to do that, which a lot of the tools that we teach and a lot of the um, exercises that we teach, we can teach that over the internet, which is a wonderful modern marvel that we can enjoy. Mm -hmm. uh, we can also travel around. If you go to the website, there is a link for speaking. Yep. Uh, that's my public speaking. I offer several different presentations uh, it, to address all different factors of uh, personal well-being and personal defense. In mm -hmm. fact, one of the subjects I cover is uh, surviving and overcoming uh, the loss of a loved one due to suicide right, yeah, because I've, I've been here. able to face that and, and conquer well, that as well with with very close friends of of mine that have uh, taken their own lives and so it's a very dear subject to me as well but we speak on on how to fortify and strengthen yourself to overcome that and self-harming thoughts as along with teaching situational awareness predator methodology uh, and basic targets and strikes and then my book is also uh, preparing to be uh, published and it is going to be the name of it is defense against frogs dogs and humans and everything in between <laughs> understanding your opponent Great. in a self situation name cool exciting very well, exciting i'm gonna ask one more question really quick um how big of a class do you recommend if you do in person you know, I have taught classes, everything from uh, over 80 people at ISU to two and three people. Uh, mm -hmm. So we can do just about any number. Uh, we can cover the, it's a little more difficult as far as the hands-on stuff with Bob, if you do a larger group, but yeah. but we can cover those groups easily. Uh, so we, we run the gambit. And also if you're dealing with your own personal business and doing a uh, corporate training or a larger business training, we can cater it to helping your own certain demographic. Yep. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we did a training for a school district in uh, Bonneville County, which is in Idaho Falls. And we went through the situational awareness and also de-escalation and how to de-escalate on the three different types of predators, because a lot of them are, their employees dealing with the youth in that area so wow. we're happy to cater it and and be able to make it customized to what your needs are and we can we can take care of you anywhere from online to in person okay we're going to be talking <laughs> <laughs> i'm good at talking <laughs> yeah we're, we're, we're going to be talking excellent excellent <laughs> well we appreciate you coming on. We're excited to have you at the show again and, and look forward. Hopefully that you're, I know you're just as excited about it. So. Yeah, it'll be a really good time. Look forward to meeting you and um, hopefully everybody makes it to your class. <laughs> it's a very important class. So to make it. Yes. And yeah. I'm doing two different classes this year. Uh, last year we did the one and due to the, overwhelming uh, response that we had we're going to do two different uh, presentations one of them is going to be on how to read a room for possible threats and then the other one is going to be focusing more on situational awareness and the three main types of predators Fabulous. yay very good <laughs> so we will get that all right well anybody have any questions you've got um the address we will be or the website address we'll be posting that and we will look forward watch on thursday um we do have another um we recorded on oh sunday 
Thank you. <laughs> we recorded on Sunday. It'll be on Thursday on live. Yep. yep. And we will be, you will see that one coming on Thursday. That was with Samantha Pala. Yeah. Samantha Pala. Yeah. So, all We're right. Try to interview everyone. As many <laughs> as we can. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you guys for joining us. We will see you shortly. Well, we'll see you on Thursday. Some one of us will be in the chat and we'll see you next Monday. Have a great week. Excellent.